distance learning temporarily. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. which contained personal data was published by the council in error. We recognize this should have been redacted before publication. Once we learned of this mistake, we have removed the electronic version from the website and taken steps to prevent the physical document from being distributed further. The council have been ensured the breach and determination in that it does not meet the threshold to report to the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office. We have lost this on our internal register and will be reviewing the process and taking necessary actions to mitigate it from occurring in future. The individuals affected will be contacted in relation to the breach. We are sorry that this has occurred. Okay. Right. Let's start with the minutes from the previous meeting. To confirm the minutes from the previous meeting, can I have a show of hands, please, to agree those minutes? Thank you. I'll show them. Have we any public questions? Sorry, Chair. Can I just ask a quick question about the minutes? Yes, sorry, yeah, Rachel. That's right. So just on page 11. Um, there's a couple of items on the forward program. It seems like there are a couple of items in mind. Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, so on page 11, uh, there's a couple of items noted on the forward program, which I don't think we've covered and we haven't got on the agenda tonight. And I don't think there's a forward program in the pack, so just to, to point that out, perhaps we can have a brief update on those items and whether that should come to the committee. Okay, so it's the audit of compliance levels and then the statement of licensing policy.
Christmas all sending in October, so it'll, we'll move the statement of license and policy onto, onto October uh, 2023, uh, and then that, that, that will then bring the back the review of the cost of the service for the birthday to October 2023 as well. So I was going to bring this up at the end, but I don't want to bring it up now. Um, so we actually got also the plan of water plan on these agendas, which is obviously just here for this. And we also had action trackers um, for recommendations made. Um, again, that's um, disappeared from this agenda. Can I, I, I guess this is for democracy services, and this could be reinstated into these agendas as standing items, please. Thank you. Okay, you have to move on. Um, item 8 is the Hackney Carriage and Private Hire documentation which are on pink paper. Okay, have I missed something? Uh, so this is the... Um, this is the actual um, policy um, consultation.
does he work? Um, Wokingham is the first. So whilst it started as a collaboration from the other councils, um, it is Wokingham that have they've gone gone first to um to public consultation and uh, introduction of the uh, re revised policy the policy aims to protect the public and build public confidence in licensed trade by promoting safeguarding children and vulnerable adults the prevention of crime disorder vehicle safety comfort and accessibility environmental sustainability and working in borough as a place to live work and visit the council does recognise the important role that taxis play in enabling people to travel and in doing so they also have a role in portraying the image of the borough and the council recognises that the majority of licence holders operate a good standard and want to provide the best possible service to their customers and this policy should therefore help the trade um, and the local economy to thrive. The draft policy is attached as Appendix A and then principles of the draft um, policy are summarised in, in Appendix D. The analysis of, of the issues, they, the majority feature around the 2020 standards and those 2020 standards are, are the crucial fit and proper person test. Um, there is no statutory definition of what amounts to a fit and proper person, but we're looking to define it and give robust guidance because ultimately when we're licensing people, they need to be, uh, we need to consider them to be fit and proper and also crucially where where existing drivers fall foul, um, we're considering against whether or not they, they're, they're fit and proper. And that's where the convictions policies come in place and DBS checks um, and, and any com complaints against um, licensees, um, they, 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 they will come out uh, around the fit and proper test. And that fit and proper test is for elected members to make, make a determination on whether or not they will keep a license at that point. In terms of that policy consultation, as attached as Appendix C, which is which is the pink paper, um, the majority of this feedback um, has come from local residents. There's a majority agreement and support for all measures that detailed within the consultation questions. Um, what I've drawn out in the report for consideration this evening by by members um, are, are two extracts which which are which are relevant. The first being is that one respondent has brought the following attention um, and they've said that they've read the policy and they'd like to make some suggestions. Clause 3.29 states that six month inspections for less than five years old, five year old vehicles and free inspections for more than five year old vehicles. They put forward that they strongly disagree with this change as it will put I think it reads as though they are a licensed driver. It will it will put themselves under under more financial pressure and their view is that uh, his view is that um or her view is, is that they think they should keep it as one inspection for less than five-year-olds and then move to two inspections um per year for um more than five year five-year-olds and add a clause for free inspections or more for any vehicles that are over 10 years 10 10 year old vehicles so they're putting uh, putting forward an, al an alternative uh, scheme around around those vehicle inspections. Separate to that, we've also received a response from Working Gumborough Council's Community Transport Manager, and what's been put forward by there is that um, can we have further information on the required driving proficiency certificate? If this is a second driving test. Um, then the, the community transport unit can't support this for school contracts. And Rebecca Brooks provides reasons for this. She describes that it'll cause a massive delay in getting new drivers through. In the meantime, uh, their costs are going to going up due to limited supply of licensed drivers, and drivers are asking for higher and higher wages by playing one company off against the other. And at the moment, there is also a high risk that there'll be in, insufficient supply of drivers to allow them to fulfil their statutory duty for September 2023 on school, school transport. I've tried to, to, to summarise here for yourselves, members, that you, you, this evening you're encouraged to, to discuss these, these two areas um, and take a view on, on those consultation responses. Both of the above measures are raised our local policy. They're not a standard that's been introduced by the DFT statutory guidance. And ultimately, these, these two issues are raised for the licensing committee to determine their own approach 
to these consultation responses. Um, the driving proficiency test, uh, Ms. Ms. Brooks is, is, is asking for detail around it. The driving proficiency test is effectively a second driving test, as she's, she's put it. It is um, a specific private hire and a uh, high carriage driver uh, DBLA type test, uh, uh, and it is effectively that it's a driving standards test. Obviously, that will improve driver standards because we can be uh, assured that we are getting a good level of driver that, that's, that's, that's coming onto our books with someone that's passed the driving test relatively soon before they're being licensed. Um, however, it is not a statutory, uh, it's not part of the statutory provision. It does exist. There is a specific um, test through the DVLA to, um, to, to test taxi drivers and, and private hire drivers, but it's not a statutory provision. So it becomes a localised policy to, to make your own determination around that as, as you see fit to, to your own policy. In terms of the um, vehicles where it comes around the age, um, we are taking a different approach in the, in the policy, as you've seen. Um, we are not specifically looking at age limits to vehicles, whereas what, that's what we've, we've done in the past. We are now looking for vehicles to meet emission standards. But at the same time, whilst we are committed to the emission standards as a, as a, as a, um, as a leading trait in terms of what we're going to license from a vehicle, we also recognise that if we end up with vehicles that, are, that become old, um, there needs to be some level of inspection to make sure that they're, they're still of a standard. The reality is older vehicles may have um, issues around uh, rusts or wear and tear, and the natural provision is to, to make sure that they're, they're inspected more, more frequently. But the balance is how frequent the committee see that as, 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 a, as, a, as, as sufficient. Councillor Stone. Yeah, age of vehicles, and you're talking about the condition of vehicles. When it comes to a private hire, and you have some of the sort of classic wedding cars that would not meet the emission standards of a Euro five or six, is there some exemption for those because they would still be a private hire, but would be used for, say, specific as I say, for weddings that type of thing. Uh, the, the the answer I can look through the policy, but um, the the answer is yes. There's there's consideration for um, for such vehicles, um, novelty vehicles, and so on. There there is there is consideration for that. Rachel, thank you. And just on the um, interval of testing that you were just outlining, so we've got in the draft policy four monthly intervals if a vehicle is over five years. Was that based on anything in particular? And also, do we know what the approximate cost of that is for the drivers? Because obviously, that you know, financial pressures is something that's mentioned. Um, I think it's um, it's based. It's it's come from the um, the initial request to the licensing uh, firm, the licensing lawyers firm. Um, so it's, it's it's come from. Um, James Button and, and Co. In terms of the provisions around uh, around that, um, in terms of um, fees, we would we would have to set the fees each each year and, and consider that as a, as a appropriate to to the to the level of um, what's required for inspecting the vehicle. So that could be it could be around sort of forty to fifty pound mark. We would have to review it every year, um, and the, the cost the cost of that is going to balance against the actual the actual cost of running it. As a, as a, the, 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 the more crucial thing here is, whilst that is that will be the cost, um, we won't be able to get around what the cost is because the cost will go on to the driver and it will be what's considered the level for, for carrying out that inspection work. Um, really, it's a case of um, how often we 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 how often um, we would feel is is appropriate for, for the number of the number of tests balanced against the, the number of years that are being suggested. Mike. I'm very concerned about this um, suggestion of lengthening the inspection periods. These vehicles do tens and tens of thousands of miles a year. 
the average mileage is typically for a for domestic owner is 12,000. These, these vehicles do five times plus. So therefore, the rate of wear and tear presumably is going to be five times as high. So if anything, I would suspect that they are not being inspected often enough. Having travelled in a number of the Reading Borough licence taxis, um, quite often it's not unusual of a mechanical engineer to hear the uh, particularly parts of the suspension knocking where the uh, bushes have worn excessively. So I'm actually very concerned about this suggestion. In Appendix 6 and Appendix 7 and elsewhere, it talks about the maintenance requirements. Nowhere does this document refer to the, the um, vehicles being serviced and maintained in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations. So they can do anything they like. And they can just say, oh, it's been serviced, we change it off, off we go. So I'm a little bit concerned that this document is, is lax in, in not requiring these vehicles to be maintained to a safe and high standard, as, as any uh, private owner would have to be. But I'm not in favour of the suggestion of length at all. In fact, I think it needs to be tightened up. Kieran, can I ask what we do we know what other authorities do about this? Um we, so we we are um we are in terms of the other authorities, the, the most recent authorities are, are, are going to be West Barks and um um Bracknell. We are the first. We are the first to, to go ahead with, with with a license on that. So in a way, we we could potentially be setting our own standard for the region. Mm. Sarah, I guess I'd like to expand that question out beyond Berkshire and what is going on elsewhere. And also with this, what is the current policy? How does this differ? Have there been any problems that have come out of the current policy that is? said that we need this where, where is this specifically come from i guess what we what problem are we ad addressing specifically is there a problem um so with the change to the emission standards uh, as the as the main driver um that that means older vehicles can be licensed um because the emission standards will 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 Will, will be set at the euro standards and it means that we'll have older vehicles than what we what we, what we currently license um so we may not put on um, a, a car if it reaches eight years old we may just we, we would we would re refuse to license it it comes off, off off the books so um what's happening here as an alternative model is that we're saying we would be able to license them provided that they meet the emission standard um but but given that we want to have um, inspections over um, over what the, the quality of that, that that car is. So in 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 one way, we are allowing what is effectively an older vehicle to come on the books, provided it meets the emissions criteria. Um, and in the balance and trade off to that, we 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 want to, we want to check that it's that it's maintained, that it's roadworthy and, and, and that, it's, uh, that, it's, that it's fit to be, to be licensed. And so we're, we're saying we want to check that more often, um, but the car could be on the road for, for, for longer. Bill. Yeah, sorry to keep coming back to an old subject that we've discussed over many periods of time. The wheelchair access, are our taxi drivers now fully aware of what they what vehicles they can buy that will meet the standards that we require. Thank you, Councillor. Um, that that has very much been included in this policy for for Wokingham itself because it has been an issue in the past for this for this borough. Um, so we've been explicit in terms of the the, the type of vehicle des design, particularly around um, our hackney carriages, because all of our hackneys will be wheelchair accessible. Um, so we've had to bring in specific dimensions there. So it's a lot it's a lot clearer now than the previous policy, which didn't have that information in. Sarah. Um, with regards to the timing for adoption of this, obviously it's got July 2023 in there. Um, 
is there a time limit? When does the current policy run out? Is there, you know, let's say, for example, we wanted to have something else investigating more evidence. Is there scope to do that within the time frame, or would we need to adopt this and uh, and redo a policy in a short period? Um, we we are on um, no set time limit. Um, there are standards in terms of the 2020 standards that we've already ad adopted, so they already exist. So we're in a we're in a, um, a very good space as a local authority because Wokingham already had a, a policy. Some of the other councils are, are starting from a point of not having a policy at all. So we're in a much more comfortable position because we already have an existing policy, and we're looking to um, bring in what's best for uh, Wokingham and then match match like for like what the 2020 standards are. The July date is 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 purely what comes onto my end. So after after this, there'll there'll have to be a few changes in terms of the office functions. Um so it's just to allow it's just to allow space for that. If it's a case that uh, members would like more time, would like to go away and benchmark against authorities that are further away from the Berkshire area, that's that's certainly possible. Um, so you, you do have that within your gift. Mm -hmm. I think it, the reason for asking, there's two areas I wonder if it's worth us exploring a bit further before we make a decision. Um, the first is um, around climate implications. All our policies should mm -hmm. be going through our climate emergency team to make sure that they're made climate informed. And I know this policy hasn't been to them. Um, and I don't know if at this stage this is as robust as it could be in that regard or not, but I think we should get a report back to find out if there's anything further we could be considering before we approve. The other area is it's around the fit and proper test because there is no statutory definition of that. Um, I'm quite interested to understand where we stack up compared to what else is happening in the country around this because in some regards, um, you know, criminal convictions can be quite obvious, but in other cases, it's not. What about civil injunctions? Where do we stand on that? Um, and I'm, I'm want, my question around that is, you know, particularly as we're going to be adopting, I mean, for example, we're going to be adopting our Vorgar Violence Against Women and Girls strategy, just as an example, later this year. This is a big piece of work that we're doing. We haven't adopted it yet. How does this fit in with our commitments there, for example? Um, and I guess I just want to explore this further to make sure that we are keeping people safe. Yeah, Abdul. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm going back to just to understand a bit more about the immersion, uh, immersion standard. Is there any sort of percentage that we have to have? Like going back to this, um, Rebecca Brooks, you know, her concern about it. But there are lots of home to school transports are really aging. So it is a concern for our climate and clean age, clean air, and et cetera. So the question was what sort of percentage level we have to have it? So you want to know for the school transports what percentage of their vehicles would be affected by the policy? Okay. I would, I would have to find that out. Then I need to put that on the speaker. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, Rachel. I think the other area we need to discuss as a committee is, is the feedback from Rebecca Brooks. Um, so the driving proficiency certificate that's it's it's not statutes or anything that's us our decide our decision you know how we implement that right but at the moment you know we've got this difficult situation where potentially it could cause an insufficient supply of drivers for school transport but on the other hand would we really want to condone a different standard a lower standard for driving children around than than everyone else so i don't know what the answer is to that but i think it's we we, we need to address it before we approve the the, the document Um, I think it 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 could well be 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 useful to 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 see if um, if there if any why what 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 the approach is from wider councils, but it 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 it, it very much is a, a local a local decision around whether you apply that to just the school vehicles or or 
or, or wider to, as, a, as an actual policy. I think within the guidance it, itself, it, it, it's relatively am, am, ambivalent because um, it, it states that this exists as a function. It's set up, it's a specific um, taxi standard test. Um, but then at the same time, it's it's dropping lower than a statutory standard. Um, so it's 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 there as a it, it's there as an option to to be to be discussed. There is a cost to the driver for onboarding, probably a, a relatively significant cost on the on the top of um, putting a car on and so on. Um, but then if it, if it if it is all the way and not used, um, then then we are we are dropping a standard that we currently have in place. So it's it's not so much putting a standard in. It, it, the ask there is to take take something away for, for what would be new only be new drivers. We don't ask for a um, driving proficiency test every year like on renewals. We just ask it for the for the new drivers on onboarding. On um, we don't we don't get. A, a, a significant amount of new drivers, um, very low levels of new drivers on the book seat each year, um, probably less than double figures. So it is a, it would re it would reflect a small proportion of the trade because the existing trade have that as a provision from when they first licensed. Um, yeah, just on that point, I, if it's something that's already happening, the way the comment was written by the officer, I read it to mean it was something new being introduced that would make something harder than it currently is. So I wonder if there's a bit of misunderstanding on the officer's part as to what's being suggested, potentially. I think we need to be very careful we don't shoot ourselves in the foot here by not being able to provide enough drivers for our children. But the other bit of that is that we want them to be as safe as they can possibly be. And so it's getting that balance right. But I think the issue here is, is that I think that comment, it, my view is that comment's been written thinking that we're adding in another barrier. Mm -hmm. When we're not, we're just maintaining an existing um, requirement. And can I ask, has um, this officer or that team ever brought this concern to you prior to this consultation? Yeah. Um, yes. I, I, the, the, there is good, good understanding that, um, that that she's aware that there's that there is, is in place at the, at the moment as a as a barrier barrier to to, to entry. Um, there is. Um, there will obviously be trade. The, the trade will be commenting on on the barriers to to entry that they're facing, and that will have a, a knock on impact to to the school's transport. So they are, they are wanting drivers. They need drivers to to be licensed. Um, and I think this 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 standard will also match the standard with 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 Reading Council. Um, and I know what's been described is that um, some of the schools transport drivers are finding difficulty to license with Reading itself because there's a there's a they have a, they are experiencing a backlog. We're 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 not experiencing a backlog. We're we're functioning um, well. Um, but of of that, there's um, there's a, there's there's effectively a barrier to entry that's highlighted around the driver position too, because it's a cost to to onboarding. So it's it's perceived as a barrier to entry. But the other perception is that it's a regulatory standard and a need for it to be there. Mm -hmm. you, Chair, perhaps I can just verify something. Apologies. Um... Apologies for being a couple of minutes behind. I was just trying to remind myself and I still can't find it. Um, the current situation is there is actually a separate policy for licensing um, community and home school transport vehicles, which is, um, for want of a better phrase, slightly lighter. For example, it doesn't include the penalty points scheme, the internal penalty points scheme. So... My understanding is that this new policy, and, and I'll turn to Kieran, who will tell me if I'm wrong, is intended to encompass everything in one space, taking into account the new 2020 standards um, and all the current guidance. So there is an element of it placing a slightly higher burden in some regard on the community uh, transport requirements. Mm -hmm. However, there is also an element of improved safety in that regard and safeguarding. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, quite, quite, quite right. Quite, quite right. Um, this, this, this policy um, has taken that into consideration um, to a certain extent. There, there is 
an overarching aim to bring um, those two policies together to have the vehicle standards the, the same level. Uh, driving proficiency will will relate to the driver themselves. Um, we've in this policy we've maintained the position that the um, school transport drivers won't have to take the knowledge test around the around the routes, which is a current level. They have a, they have a separate policy where they don't have to do um, a local area knowledge test, whereas whereas our private hire and hand carriage drivers will will do that. So there is there are some caveats through this policy that that touch on the fact that there's been a separate policy. So there are there are some looser ties looser ties to that. But overall. This policy is looking to be um, as unanimous with with the full trade. I was just going to express a, a view on this particular discussion topic, um, maybe to kick things off. But I think my view is, given that we're talking um, from a community transport unit point of view, we are talking about some of the most vulnerable people in our community. We're talking about our SEND children. Um, and other vulnerable people, um, my personal belief is we need to maintain um, that, that same level because we are talking about the most vulnerable people in our community. I think what Sarah said, I echoes, um, I mean, I'm supporting on what she said because it's best to make it one rather than make it two. And children's safety is first. I know it's going to cost more. Well, there are some drivers, but we need to improve and more come more robust. Yes, thank you, Jordan. Yes, I, I had a question regarding uh, certificates of good character. I've seen here in the standards that it recommends that any applicant that lives outside for more than three months should produce certificates of good character. I was wondering why in the policy we've gone for six months instead of three. Uh, so that's pages 16 for the standards and second, page 33. So page 33. And what you highlight on the end. Yeah, I've got that, that one. And then at, you're saying that within the standards themselves, it's listed as, as three months. Yes. That could be an oversight, or there, there, there could be could be a reason could be a reason for it. I can see there, yes, e overseas convictions. Um, I, I, I'll investigate that further and see if there there is an actual reason for it. Could we go back to the emissions um, item that Sarah brought up, because clearly climate change is upon us, and we need to make sure that all the vehicles fit those emission things and again we're not embarrassing ourselves by having vehicles on the road that don't fit in with our policies um, we need to know should it go to that climate change group Sorry, I just want to say on that. It's a corporate priority. Yeah. Every policy that's been developed by this council has to go through the climate team. We shouldn't be making decisions on policy that haven't. So we can make informed choices. Then if that's the policy, it needs to go there. Which means that we don't approve it tonight until we see those results from... Sorry, Rachel. Yeah, or we could approve it subject to that review. Yeah, yes, but I think I mean, I'd like just to see bit, that report you know. on the climate. Um, there's, there's, there's a number of items that you've 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 picked out for a bit of bit of clarification there. Um, and whilst whilst that absolutely needs to happen around the, the climate emergency, that will give will give provide a little bit of space to to, to, to the other these things. these minor minor things. So um, probably quite sensible. Would it be? Could it? be done in time for our next meeting. October. Yeah. Depends on how they what do you think, Sarah? Do you know? I can't speak on behalf of no. officers. No. Yeah. 
Um, I would have to check with democratic services and find out when when they meet and see if they can they can be brought brought into brought into line. So I'll I'll, I'll speak with democratic services and and see if they they tally up. Is everyone happy about that? Just to be clear, I'm not talking about the climate over being scrutiny meeting. I'm talking about it going to offices. Mm. Okay. So um, it's not within a formal democratic meeting. It just needs to go to the team to review all policies. Everyone happy with that? Yeah. Yeah. And that gives us time to do all that other work. Sorry, Jordan. Sorry, just to um, clarify your statement there, um, Kieran. Was it, did you mean that you would come back to us with the number of issues that have been raised before um, it, it's reviewed by the planet team? No, they no. simultaneously. Yeah, no, I would, I would. So I would take that as a task now, because um, the, the issues that have been raised are around um, fit and proper, some of the cr criminal convictions, which I, which I think, I think the policy is, is, is relatively good um in terms of what's what's been what's what's been detailed there um but I'll, i'm happy to, to to look through that work um there is the the um violence against women and girls strategy which needs to be um looked into i know that's from an officer function as well um so i think that the the, the this this there's it sounds like there's there's a space between this oct because the next meeting is October, um, so to me it sounds like there's there's enough space there to 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 achieve both those tasks because um, they're both officer related functions. So um, so they would go simultaneously, and then if we bring that potentially if we bring it back to October, um, we should have some more answers to the to the other areas um, which has been raised around which vehicles are affected and so on. Everyone's happy with that. Thank you. So it could be on the October agenda. OK, item nine, uh, an approach for tackling gambling related harm. Um, this is something that we've been talking about for a while that's come out of discussions around poverty uh, uh, and alcohol. And we asked for a report. Page 135. Want to open up, Kim? Thank yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, um, so th th thank you um, so far for, for, for the opportunity to, um, to, to, to research this, this area of work. Um, it has been brought to the committee before, um, and we're looking to, to, to basically pro progress that work stream. So the report that's coming to um, to, to, to committee now, it, it's um, it's how local authorities are responsible for issuing gambling premises licensing, monitoring compliance with the terms of those licenses and the wider gambling mm -hmm. act, and then taking enforcement action if necessary. Uh, and they're required to have regard to the gambling acts licensing objectives, one of which is the protection of children and other people from being harmed or exploited by gambling. The recommendation this evening um, for members is that the committee notes that the statement of gambling notes the statement of gambling principles and decides that officers should initiate an operation in in reference to the best practice for the licensing authority as identified by the local government association guidance. In terms of a summary of this report, the licensing authority does have a policy, which is an overarching statement of principles setting out how they will approach gambling regulation. And then to help tackle gambling related harm is recommended by the local government association to take a series of st steps relating to the licensing authority itself um, as a as a as a as a nuclear um, area and that's to undertake um, an up-to-date local area profile in relation to gambling related harms, set out expectations of local gambling operators and risk assessment processes, undertake the compliance visits and use enforcement tools appropriately, undertake underage te uh, sales testing and encourage local gambling premises to apply for GAMCARE certification for best-in-class player protection policies and undertake GAMCARE training courses. The policy, uh, the, the report this evening is 
relatively um, uh, relatively short in terms of, of a report. We've we've previously met. Um, we looked at taking steps to review the council policy, but we found that the statement of licensing policy um, is in effect um, from, it was adopted on the 18th of November 2022, and it's in effect until uh, 2025, and I've attached that as Appendix C. Um, what the um, report links through to is the LGA guidance as well in terms of the councillor uh, councillor's handbook. And then also, uh, which is which is important for for the direction of members here, is for local authorities on tackling gambling gambling related harm, and that's been attached as, as Appendix B. And this deals with how councils themselves can use regulatory tools to help tackle gambling gambling related harm. What we identified in previous meetings was that um, the local authority has not conducting um, inspections of betting premises uh, and has not conducted um, underage test purchase operations prior to this. We submit a um, return to the Gambling Commission each year. Uh, and they've been nil returns. That's both from um, the PPP days and to where Working Gum is set up. So we are working from a, a step of zero uh, and uh, and doing this as, as an initial approach, which has obviously been been, been triggered by, by yourselves as, as elected members. Um, the step forward here um, is that the committee is invited to direct officers to to um, step forward to take step forwards towards the best practice identified by the LGA, and then receive a report back on the findings of that operation at a committee later in the calendar year. We also um, we also re recognise that the opening concept of this as um, as a as a as a as a uh, function to 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 explore in terms of a report is to is to achieve a full council approach. Um, so what we're putting forward is effectively a first step to um, gain whatever evidence or data is available from the licensing functions and to pursue the licensing functions to which this committee relates and has control and capacity over. Um, it would be a relatively small operation, so we're not considering it um, in terms of a major financial budget to the council to achieve. We have a handful of betting premises. Obviously, if we find that there is um, significant non-compliance, then that could 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 change, um, and it may 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 lead to reviews of, of licensed premises. Um, but at the moment, we're at a benchmark of of not knowing, um, so it's difficult to predict any any significant fin financial costs. And it is expected that uh, an operation of this sort um, would would be facilitated within the offices that are already already employed. Um, so so. Uh, the, the the report itself is, is is invited to direct the officers towards taking that first step um bring that back to the committee in october um and then from that point we'll have some sort of data to to provide to members and if that then leads to a wider conversation which goes outside of the licensing committee for the council itself to tackling gambling gambling related gambling related harm um then it it could be could be quite a um could be quite a significant step uh, in terms of uh, catalyzing catalyzing that as an approach. Bill and then Abdul. Yeah, at previous meeting, I, I think I asked the, the question about the uh, the uh, council's policy on advertising of gambling on our taxes, and you said that this was something that was being looked at. Is there any further news on that? Um, so that links. Back to the um, previous um, policy, I, I think we've taken a decision that, or I, we've not taken any decision. Mm. We're still um, looking at it. Let me go back to you, you're the advertising. You're on the previous item, though. Yes, yeah, but yeah. they overlap. Mm. You know, they've got mm. things saved up. But the point I've talked about the previous meeting, whether it was under gambling or under. I can't remember. He was under advertising, I think. Yeah. Just had a table of contents to find it. I've seen it in here. I can't remember where. I think it was the last meeting. Yeah. Here on the yeah. Page yeah. forty. Forty-five. 
did you find it? Page 45. So for advertising, we have put forward the descriptions around the wrap criteria. Um, where we've got to with that is we've said that any advertisements on any vehicles must comply, um, must be legal and comply with the Advertising Standards Agency Code of Practice. So it, it does not step into um, limiting that, that, that type of advertising. Um, that, that could be something that it so goes into the previous item, but if we wanted to have a steer in terms of advertising and what what may go on that on those vehicles, that would be um, that would that would come under under that that policy for for sure. We can we can we sh we can make our own decisions if we want to expand more around around the advertising, um, particularly if if um, if you did not want to have um, gambling. Yeah. Can you use your mic? Please? Yeah. I think it would be a decision that would have to be made by a committee, but uh, in my view, it would be a decision worth making that, you know, we don't allow advertising of gambling on licensed taxis. I think you're absolutely right, Bill. So we need to link those two together and in that and advertising, put in the gambling and maybe an alcohol um, suggestion about advertising. That's probably where the big money is. OK, so I'll add that as an action to um, the previous queries around the, the policy and it'll be brought back to the committee in October. Abdul. I was just wondering if we can have some form of data from our, our local authority just to look at it, see how. On gambling, especially the children's side of it yeah. and the mobile apps and all that. If we can have some data we can look at. Thank you. Um, there the, the, the will be data available um, at the at the moment, um, and I, I I think where where this is is going to go, councillor, is is um, that gather gathering of, of of data for for gambling related harm. It, it may be the case that it, it doesn't sit in terms of licensing committee uh, as a role because it's such a big issue. Um, it could be the case that it goes to another area of the council, like public health and so on. However, having said that, there's quite clearly an identified role for the licensing can, licensing service to play. Um, so what we will bring back is, um, following that operation, we will bring back the evidence from that. So how, um, how, how those gambling operators are faring, whether or not that the test purchasing is is successful or a failure, um, their own principles, because we don't we license the premises itself, um, and the, the gambling related harm is, is is much wider because of because of technology and apps and so on, and that that sits with the gambling commission. Mm -hmm. But we do have a role as a committee. We do have betting premises. Um, so what's being set out here is to. Um, is, is a position to follow that LGA guidance around what the licensing authority itself can do um, and then be in a position to bring back that that level of data following that mm. following that operation. Um, but I, I, I sense what you're saying and I can picture what you're saying. It's just that once you've once you've got that, if, if we're already in, a, if we're already in a position where we're saying that we can look at the LGA guidance and we're prepared to run an operation to do what what we can achieve, um then um the need for that type of, of data probably doesn't need to even even come come towards us because really we're in we're interested in fulfilling our small area within it and then leading into the conversation that could be wider and then that collection of data um would be what would form the full council approach but if it is a, it's a sensible thing to try and to try and collect Sarah. Thanks. Um, with regards to other parts of the council, I mean, looking at planning firstly, and the um, LGA guidance um, talks quite a bit about local planning and um, local area profiles. Um, and um, it made reference to a couple of um, case studies where having planning policy around this has helped shape this for the better. Um, we're obviously going through a local plan update at the moment as an authority. Is licensing feeding into that local plan update? at the moment 
um, around this and is that something that could happen if not if we make a recommendation for that i'm i'm not com 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 completely sure how <coughs> how we would go about feeding in um to make rec recommendations to, to 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 other other committees, whether that would go through as a as a as a chair to the licensing committee to make a recommendation, um, I think it is something we would probably have to explore from a governance perspective to to, to see whether or not our committee could have a, a say or influence through through to another committee, or or if that's if that's even the right manner to to address these these types of these types of issues. I'm not necessarily saying that this committee should explicitly state what goes into the LPU on this, but I guess I was really suggesting the principle of licensing, having an opportunity to feed into the LPU. So I was looking at one of the examples about cumulative effect, for example. So is that being considered through local planning policy with the LPU or not? As an example, is that something that the licensing officer function can feed into the LPU officer function yeah. that's then considered when obviously the whole council votes on the local plan update when it finally comes to us so everyone would have that opportunity as a whole council to do that that that's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. I think I understand what what what, what you're saying councillor um Kerr, but um in terms of cumulative impact um we we have low, low levels of 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 of, of premises uh, within 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 the borough, um, it's where where we're not in the likes of the the, the economies of, of perhaps Reading as our closest or a London borough. We're, we're not necessarily seeing that um, cumulative the, the cumulative impact of 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 of, 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 of betting shops. Um, I think if um, if planning were to to take that forward they they, they may even find their, their own difficulty in adopting such, such such a policy with it because there is such such low levels um it, it could be an option um what i would what i would put forward at, at the moment is to give the opportunity for ourselves as officers to, to to go ahead with um what operation we we can do to basically make an assessment of the impact that those those betting shops are having um and because at the at the moment, we, we we've we've not carried out any inspections and we've not done any test purchases, so we can't really say how much of an impact they're having or 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 not is the reality of the situation that we're in at the moment. Um, and and really, I think we need to complete that that exercise and then come back. And if we've got data and we've got something to of note to say, then we may have a, a soundboard to to other areas. Um, okay. It's difficult because I think the reality is we can all recognise that that there the, the will be a national problem with, with with betting. It's it's just how how we can we can feed into that conversation. And I think our our starting point at this point is to do what's within our gift. There's a, a licensing committee. Have our officers go out, see how they're functioning as as operators, and then bring that information back. And from there, you'll you'll at least have some sort of content to perhaps steer a narrative if that if that needs to be formed um, or, or not. Thank you. I appreciate that at this moment in time, you know, uh, we only have so many, but the reason why this was brought up was because obviously a very prominent, um, in Wokingham Town Centre, a very prominent position was taken over by a betting shop during a cost of living crisis, which is where this item mm -hmm. came from. The local plan lasts for 15 years. A lot can change in that time and to retrospectively try and put something in if a problem comes about is much harder than putting something preventative in at this stage, which is why I'm suggesting it. Um, Going beyond, though, obviously, and I appreciate this is a really tricky thing. We're here as a licensing authority, and this is where this has been raised. But the the, the LGA um, document was really, really useful looking at this as a, as a wider issue, in particular the stuff around public health. Um, and I know that's not within this committee's gift and this, you know, this um, function of the council's gift to, to look at that whole thing. But I do think we don't know the effects if any of gambling has in this area at all. We know that um that you know stores you know have opened during a very challenging financial time for people. Is that having an impact or not? And I wonder if we need to be 
looking elsewhere in the council to get that data, understand actually what the situation is, see if there is something that needs to be looked at, because obviously it is a public health issue. Um, and and uh, um, we obviously have our commitments around tackling poverty as well. Um, and, and this ties in very much to that priority for, for us as a local authority and that whole council approach. So while the licensing authority, um, you know, I, I think it's a great idea that the team go out and do what you're suggesting. I do wonder if that the rest of this committee or this committee can make a recommendation sort of more strategically to, to the council from a corporate perspective to say, can we actually look at data from across the council for all the different areas that this affects, just to see and understand, because at the moment we don't know enough to know this is fine, or actually there's an underlying problem here that we're not aware of and we could be doing something about it. So I wonder if we need to be considering that, and I'd welcome thought some other people on the committee about this. If I can add to that, um, I, I look at Woodley Precinct and I can see three or four shops that bring nothing, in my opinion, to the precinct. There's a very posh flashing lights vaping shop, a couple of gambling shops, um, and I'm not quite sure what good they are to us. They're generating income for um, the landlords and the tenants, but what good are they to us as, as responsible adults? So I'd like to look at that, anything that can bring harm. Mike. Um, I'm not going to comment on that. But what I wanted to say was that one of the issues of gambling, particularly since the pandemic uh, commencement, is a huge amount has shifted online. Mm. According to the Gambling Commission now, mm. um, the, the, the amount of gambling carried out inside premises compared to the gambling online is now equal. I don't think this committee has any reason to be able to, or capacity for that matter, to be able to look at that. No, I don't think anybody does. Just, just other, than, uh, other than to ensure that we don't allow our taxis and our public transport to carry adverts for online mm. gambling, which is not mm. the same thing contained, mm. contained in this. And there are, as Sarah says, a number of gambling premises around. Some of them are very prominent, and but I guess the, the people who own them it's a commercial decision uh, whether they, they cite them there. There's one cited right next door to a secondary school in Early, mm -hmm. and has been there for many years. And never seems to have more than one or two people in it. So, how on earth it justifies its existence, I really don't know. But I think this is an excellent exercise, it, 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 but it's only tactic harm the problem. I think we might be opening the can of worms, but nevertheless, it needs to be opened. Well, this is why I'm suggesting, you know, it's not, you know, there's a small part within this remit, but there is a wider thing. Is this something we want to maybe suggest that corporately the council looks at to see it's not going to be just about the gambling premises that um, Kieran's team can, can do what they're suggesting. And I think that's a really good start. But is this something we want to maybe make a suggestion to the relevant place within the council? Mm -hmm to say, actually, can we look at what data we have? Can we understand, you know, how many suicides um, in this borough are we able to attribute through the public health data we have to gambling related issues, for example? I don't know. I don't know what data we have, but it is quite a hidden problem. There's a huge stigma about it, but we could maybe do something about actually taking away that stigma and helping people to come forward for help, for example. Um, and we might be able to help people go into more harm and you know, we have we have an opportunity, I think, not necessarily as a committee, but as a local authority with our partner organisations. That that's what I'm suggesting, having read through what the LGA recommends and that whole council approach. Um, and yes, it's not up to this committee to decide to do that, but we could make a suggestion um, to the relevant. I don't know if it would be exec or, or whatever, but we could make that suggestion that it's something we look at. Yeah, we've set the officers quite a, a big task to bring back to the next meeting. And so I think that it'll involve further discussion then, depending on what we see. Is everyone OK with that? Sorry, Michael. Yeah, perhaps just to add on to Sarah's point, actually, uh, very well, well made. But what about the effect on the families of the gambling people that are gambling, um, mm. who, who are not gamblers themselves, but it, it is far reaching. So. Mm. Maybe, but yeah, I think make a point. We don't want to stretch off just too far, but if that could be included, it could be useful. 
I think we'll have to see where it goes and what capacity we've got. But yes, you're right, absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Any more on that agenda item? Well, guys, you can all go home in daylight because today's yeah. a very long day. Okay. There are no other items on the agenda, so class dismissed.